Okay, so um, not sure if anyone is joining remotely today. Um, seems like a sparse class. Maybe we're still missing a few. Maybe they'll come in. Um, it is nice today. So, um, so uh, a few things. Uh, I'm not sure whether I will be here next Tuesday or not. I haven't uh, settled plans on when I go back uh, home. It's basically, do I spend Easter with my uh, daughters or do I spend it with my girlfriend who's back in uh, St. Louis? So. Uh, big big decision there. That's <laughs> like good luck. You know, you're still in a hard place and not. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but yeah. So um, I may or may not be here uh, Tuesday, but probably after that, unlikely I'll be back. It's maybe I get back uh, right at the end of the semester, uh, right around the uh, beginning of May, uh, finals week, that type of thing. Uh, but that's a bit of a, a stretch. Uh, so, but it's been great meeting you. Uh, I would like to, uh, it's it's way too late in the semester to, to even do this, but if you ask a question today, just tell me your name. And uh, if you want, uh, I assume everyone in here is probably electrical engineering, but if you're not, yeah, I'm computer or whatever. And uh, are you going to grad school? Or are you going to uh, get a job? Do you have an offer yet? Have you accepted? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, or are you doing a gap year or or whatever? Just um, that's just so I can get to know y'all a little bit. Uh, uh, it's been great working with you, and uh, wish we could be face to face more. But um, yeah, I gotta I gotta go back to my other life. So um, so speaking of scheduling today, we'll talk about receiver noise analysis. We're off on Friday, if I've read the schedule correctly, and uh, on Tuesday. We'll talk about spread spectrum uh, a little bit and uh, gonna try to just cram a whole lot into uh, one uh, one class period and we'll talk about kind of the concepts and then we'll just mention a few different types and associate those with uh, the, um, uh, maybe some popular uh, standards out there and that type of thing. And then we'll, but it'll be time to have a, a quiz, uh, an exam. So uh, I think the exam will go back to, um, you know, convolutional uh, block coding, convolutional coding, uh, that type of thing. And uh, yeah, all the way, all the way through uh, spread, spread spectrum. Uh, won't really have time to do like a homework assignment on spread spectrum before the test. So, you know, I'll go easy on that, but uh you know, maybe ask some conceptual questions, but um, I think your homework's due today, and then there's uh, a lab due, and then uh, I'm going to release a new homework uh, today or tomorrow, and uh, I hate to, like, give you a bunch of work over a holiday, but, uh, you know, I want, uh, I want it to be uh, back so we can briefly cover uh, the homework on uh, on Tuesday. And uh, so we'll do uh, a Viterbi decoder problem, uh, the Huffman coding, the Lempel ziv coding, and um, uh, then uh, a short receiver noise analysis. So um, hopefully uh, that works and uh, then that should, uh, prepare you well for the exam. And um, I'll go back to regular office hours, but I, I still feel like, uh, you know, some of y'all have made arrangements for office hours uh, with me uh, at different times when we've met on Zoom, and uh, that works great. Uh, no one's actually been able to make my regularly scheduled office hours, so I might change them. I mean, does after, like, this class work for you all, or or something, maybe I'll I'll try to give you some 
better options. It it doesn't matter uh, much to me, um, but uh, but yeah, that would work out. So uh, let's get on with today's uh, lecture then, and uh, I'll try to go through this uh, quickly, and uh, then we'll uh, go over the uh, homework. Uh, using MATLAB. So, um, all right, receiver noise analysis is a little bit uh, more of a circuits and uh, 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 systems type of uh, topic and not really this uh, kind of mathematical, theoretical uh, communications uh, type topic. But I like it because I think it brings a lot of context to what you're doing. I remember when I originally studied the theory of communication systems, I'd already been working with circuits and, and that type of thing quite a bit. And that was in my mind. And so when we kept talking about the signal noise ratio or energy per bit, I'm like, but, but, but doesn't that depend upon your transmit power and your link budget and, and that type of thing. So we'll just uh, look a little bit at uh, these things today. Uh, We'll uh, recover some, uh, you know, uh, re go over the thermal noise and phase noise, uh, introduce noise factor and noise figures, and look at cascaded noise figure analysis. Uh, we'll uh, look at intermodulation distortion and uh, then maybe get to spur free dynamic range um, if we move along here. So, uh, thermal noise uh, recall any circuit with resistance. And uh, above absolute zero produces some sort of uh, noise because those electrons are moving, right? And uh, the uh, electrons moving in a resistor are going to uh, represent a current through that resistor, and therefore you're going to have a voltage drop, right? So, uh, so we have these uh, voltages that are um, uh, sensitive to. Uh, the resistance and the temperature and the bandwidth, right? So um, uh, ideally, these noise processes, we kind of pretend that they're infinite in bandwidth. They're not quite, uh, they do, uh, you know, change their nature uh, uh, at super high, you know, crazy high frequencies, right? And, um, uh, but uh, to, you know, the, the frequencies that we tend to worry about, uh, we can assume that the spectrum of the noise is flat and therefore it's autocorrelation. Uh, you know, it's a random process. So uh, we, we don't really talk about time and frequency domain so much as we talk about power spectral density and uh, autocorrelation, right? So we kind of try to touch on some of those things at the beginning of the semester with random processes. But um, uh, that uh, power spectral density is flat and therefore its autocorrelation is an impulse, right? And um, very analogous to uh, deterministic systems here. Uh, it does roll off, uh, like I say, but uh, so, you know, practical systems have a bandwidth and so that's going to kind of chop off a certain amount of energy out of that spectrum and filter out the rest, right? So, um, and uh, this K is Boltzmann's constant. Uh, if we look at power, we just uh, square that result. Uh, this is actually, uh, you know, this these equations here are uh, Taylor series approximations to a more complete model. If the frequency is really high or the temperature is really low, then we need to look at that uh, more complex one, but I'm not going to worry about it because I've never used it. Um, T here, remember, is in Kelvin. So if it's given in Celsius, you need to, uh, you know, add uh, or, um, yeah, add to 273 to it to convert it to Kelvin. All right, let's look at a simplified uh, RF receiver front end. Uh, this, uh, first of all, is, you know, is very simplified, but it's showing kind of the major blocks in the system. Uh, note that in the old days, this is all analog. And then, you know, as technology is advanced in digital electronics, we 
kind of move the, the analog to digital threshold or conversion closer and closer to the antenna. Okay. So uh, uh, that that slice could happen at any of these points in this uh, in this system. So we've got an antenna. It has finite bandwidth, possibly gain and some directivity. Okay. Uh, we have a low loss filter here uh, that's not super tight uh, in terms of matching the spectrum, uh, but its job is to uh, get rid of uh, a lot of interfering signals uh, in order to protect this low noise amplifier, right? This has a sensitive input because it's trying to measure, um, you know, microvolts of uh, signals from these uh uh, the antenna, right? So, um, so we're, uh, I think we mentioned air modulation distortion. We're going to cover that uh, a little bit uh, in the second half of this lecture, right? So the low noise amplifier uh, has moderate gain, but it's really designed to uh, be as uh, uh, clean or as noise free as possible, right? So, and it's possibly, probably followed by more gain stages. Okay. Then we have a mixer, a nonlinear device. And uh, if we, uh, it has an RF port, a local oscillator port, it's called a local oscillator down here, and an IF or an intermediate frequency port. So it's a three port uh, device. Um, the, it's purposely nonlinear. It's acting like a switch where this local oscillator is driven hard enough to uh, switch some diodes on and off, okay? I'm not gonna get any deeper than that. That's a circuit course. Um, so this local oscillator uh, uh, ideally has very low phase noise and uh, it's possibly tuned. Uh, sometimes you'll have uh, kind of two stages of these and maybe the second one will be tuned or both will be tuned, but um, yeah. So uh, the output of this, is a uh, set of uh, uh, copies of this input frequency, but they're input signal, but they're translated to different frequencies by this mixing process. And the ones we're typically interested in is the um, uh, difference between these two uh, frequencies. Uh, and um, uh, that if uh, this is like 20 gigahertz and this is 21 uh, gigahertz, then the IF could be one gigahertz, right? So um, uh, we're just uh, looking at the, the difference. Not exclusively that way. There's some other cases. You'll actually have frequencies out here that's twice CRF, twice CLO, um, all, all sorts of different combinations. But these are the strongest ones and the ones we're interested in. Then we're going to have an intermediate frequency filter, okay? And that is going to essentially be our matched filter, okay? And that's going to remember with the match filter, we're trying to create a filter that um, matches in its spectral characteristics the signal spectrum, right? And that way we get rid of as much noise as possible without removing any signal, right? So if our uh, filter shape is matching the uh, signal shape in the spectrum, and yeah, there's technically a, a mirror imaging, but most many signals are symmetric in, in spectra. So, um, and uh, so it's providing the uh, really good uh, uh, selectivity. So if you've got, uh, you know, a, a channel here that you're talking on on your cell phone. There's uh, other channels right next door, right next door, right? And so we're trying to uh, select just one of those signals and get rid of all the others, right? That filtering function. And then we got an integrator and then ultimately our symbol decision logic threshold, right? Uh, where we're trying to figure out which, which symbol in that constellation does this match up to? Uh, this is in digital communications often a little bit more complex than you know what's shown here, and it's emitting an in phase and a quadrature signal.
basically a complex signal, an A plus JV type of thing. So uh, we call that an I and Q. I hope I've used those terms before. And so uh, in a lot of this, these will be two parallel paths after this mixer for an I and Q. Yes. Could you explain what an I and Q is again? Okay. Is. What's your name? You came in late because yeah. I uh, I said anyone asks a question has to say their name. So uh, just because I haven't had a chance to learn anything. Okay. Um, so my name is Harris. Harris. Okay. Great. Um, so <laughs> what what is what? Is yeah, like, do explain like what it is again because. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the I stands for the in phase uh, component of a signal, and the uh, Q stands for the quadrature. And if you think back uh, about our QAM constellations, and we have these uh, uh, constellation points, these symbols uh, arranged in this kind of two dimensional grid, right? And you can think of that horizontal or traditionally x-axis as the I or the in phase uh, part of that uh, signal. And the Q would be the quadrature part or along the x, uh, the y-axis, right? And so uh, we, uh, there's a little trick in digital signal processing in that if we do complex sampling, right? We can take, you know, is signal out in the air is real. Right, it's got to be real because uh, imaginary signals really are imaginary, right? But uh, uh, we take this real signal, and normally uh, uh, Shannon uh, Nyquist theorem says what? We have to sample at twice the highest frequency in the signal, and we can do bandpass sampling. Uh, so we, but we have to sample it twice, at least twice of the highest frequency content in our signal. And uh, otherwise we get aliasing, right? So um, that's kind of a pain. So because it gets really expensive uh, to sample really fast and uh, with a lot of resolution, right? So if we want 16 bits uh, really fast, that's a very, very expensive type of uh, uh, ADC, analog to digital converter, right? So uh, the trick we use is we, uh, instead, sample at about the highest frequency, but we kind of basically have uh, two samplers in parallel, and uh, we arrange it so that one is representing an in-phase component, and the other one's representing a quadrature component of the signal. And that way, we can get, um, uh, we can satisfy Shannon's sampling theorem with half the sampling frequency in our system. It's a lot cheaper. We just need two copies of it because now we need to keep track of our I and our Q separately. These are just still digital words, you know, 16-bit, 12-bit, 8-bit, whatever. And uh, they're, they're uh, you know, being sampled. So you have one after another and uh, hopefully they're aligned, right? So um, that's, that's my other question. Paris. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No one name. That's awesome. Okay. So, um, all right. Now, let's look at noise, noise figure, and noise factor. So, um, the uh, noise figure or factor uh, quantifies the noise added by a device. In other words, for example, an amplifier, mixer, or filter that we've just seen on a previous slide, right? And the way we do this is, uh, this is the, the factor, we use an F for a factor, and that's in linear uh, uh, dimensions, units, okay? And uh, whereas the NF, or noise figure, is the dB, you know, 10 log, 10 log uh, base, base 10 of that ratio, right? So we take the, uh, signal to noise ratio at the input of the device and the signal to noise ratio at the output of the device. Now, if the device itself has no noise, then those would be equal, right? Um, we're going to maybe amplify the signal, but we'll also be amplifying the noise. So the ratio would stay the same. Unfortunately, you know, transistors have a noise, any resistors, 
you have in a circuit are going to have a noise and they're going to add a little bit of noise to that signal, right? So you receive something uh, from the antenna, it's going to have a certain signal strength and a certain noise strength, right? And then uh, as you amplify it, signal goes up, the noise goes up, but we have a little bit of added noise because we have non-ideal uh, elements, right? So generally our signal noise ratio at the output is going to be worse, right? Uh, we're gonna have higher noise on the bottom. Uh, worse signal noise ratio means a smaller value, right? Because we really want signal, we don't want the noise. Signal on top, numerator, noise is the denominator. And uh, so if our noise goes up, our signal noise ratio is going down. If we want to uh, demodulate a you know large uh, MRE constellation like a you know 16 qualm, 256 qualm, 1024 qualm, uh, we need more and a better and better signal to noise ratio as our constellations go up in size. Remember, we use a larger constellation, then we're saving bandwidth. Right? We're encoding more bits into symbols, but the trade-off is that they kind of get closer and closer together, and uh, we need a better signal-noise ratio to be able to figure out what symbol is uh, what, right? So um, now, as you just a note, we won't really go into it. Uh, maybe I'll mention it when we talk about satellite communications, but that's going to be a very brief lecture. So, um, uh, but in some cases, we just relate this to an effective noise temperature of a device. Uh, so basically, the hotter something is, the more noise it's going to generate, right? Remember from that equation we, we looked at? So uh, we can uh, kind of track that by talking about a noise temperature. And uh, so in satellite communications, that's uh, the, the convention. But um, uh, in other systems, we talk about this noise figure. And uh, so noise figure is often specified in dB, but many equations expect it to be in a linear form uh, F. So uh, it's, if it's if the equation is showing it as a product, uh, that probably means it's expecting it in its linear form, right? Because products, when you take logs, turn into sums, right? So um, if it's a sum, Maybe it's uh, it's uh, expecting an NDP. So uh, just a, a hint to keep track of that. All right. So uh, a single stage low noise amplifier might have a noise factor of 2 dB. I mean, it could be less, it could be more. But uh, I'm trying to give you an idea of the order of magnitude of these uh, these values. Oh, oh. And, uh, and a gain of 7 to 12 dB. Okay. So, uh, so it's amplifying everything but also adding a little bit of noise not twice not not quite twice uh right 3 db would be twice but um filters uh have a noise figure equal to their insertion loss so an ideal filter would have no loss right but especially at rf frequencies when you might use uh crystals or ceramics or uh, waveguides or microstrip lines or these different type of uh, circuit elements that are working in the analog uh, domain, they're uh, going to have some sort of loss to them, okay? And uh, those, you know, might range from 0.5 to, to 3 dB, okay? It could be, could be more. So, um, uh, so their noise figure is equivalent to the insertion loss. So if, if you stick a filter in there that has a 3 dB insertion loss, uh, 3 dB, remember, is a factor of uh, two. So it's having the signal power, right? So that's it's uh, decreasing the signal power. We wish it wouldn't, but that's, that's a reality, right? So then we would call its noise figure equal to that, okay? So insertion loss is like a negative of the gain or reciprocal of the gain if you're working in a, a linear unit. So, um, so if we were saying, uh, put this in terms of its gain, it would be minus 3D. But uh, you know, when we call it a loss, we 
we just call it uh, uh, in the positive uh, terms there. Mixers tend to uh, have a slightly higher noise figure than their conversion locks. When you stick that RF signal in to the input of the mixer and you're putting the local oscillator in also uh, at the other port, and then you have an output, okay? There's some conversion loss through that process typically, uh, unless, unless you added some gain into the circuit, right? So, um, and, uh, but it's also electronic component. It's basically some diodes. And so those are going to also add a little bit of noise to it. So uh, it's gonna have a loss and then a little bit more. So um, if that's their noise figure. Oscillators tend to operate in a saturated mode, right? So uh, it's kind of like a, a limiting uh, amplifier. So, uh, that means that their amplitude noise is minimal. So if you're uh, uh, operating a saturated uh, uh, um, amplifier, it's kind of like a switch, right? So uh, remember back to your electronics uh, class, uh, maybe you looked at saturated mode amplifiers, right? And uh, so you're not really able to amplify. So any amplitude noise, tends to just uh, still produce uh, that same constant voltage output. Yes. Hi, I'm Brian. Okay, Brian. so this is um, the receiver receiver noise. So when you're mm -hmm. at the transmitter, does that also have noise in and of itself, which is carried into the signal? Yes. Into the panel? Yes. So uh, a, a transmitter also has noise. Uh, it tends to be the uh, receiver that uh, causes us our heartburn. Because uh, in, the, in the transmitter, we're already starting with strong signals, right? I mean, you've got to take a microphone and amplify that. So there's there's some noise there. But once we've done that, uh, then our signals are pretty strong. So our noise is very, very small in comparison. So theoretically, yes, practically, the receiver is what we're worried about. So oscillators don't have much amplitude noise, but they do have a phase noise. Right, and that uh, begins to look like it's it's modulated. So it's um, if you recall, maybe from your electronics course, you uh, probably studied stability of an amplifier and noted that uh, if you wanted to make an oscillator, you do uh, some positive feedback, and uh, at a certain frequency, that phase around the loop is an integer number of 360 degrees, two pi, right? And so you have positive reinforcement, positive feedback at the input and that causes an oscillator, right? That uh, only happens at one frequency, hopefully, right? If you're trying to design an oscillator, but any sort of uh, phase noise in that feedback loop will translate to a slightly different frequency. Okay, think about that uh, oscillator. Again, this isn't a circuits course. I'm just trying to give you some context on uh, how these things look. So uh, this is an oscillator uh, uh, perspective, and you know we'd like that to be an impulse in the frequency domain, but uh, we've got some sort of uh, broadening of this peak, and then we have some noise out here. Some of this might be an artifact of the measurement system, but uh, but this is going to occur that you've got some noise that uh, prevents this oscillator from being an ideal impulse. That's why I spent the first 13 years of my career on it, is oscillators and RF filters. So um, that's also what I'm talking about. So kind of cool. Uh, so oscillators vary about their ideal center frequency due to minute phase shifts over uh, time. This broadens the ideal impulse and it can obscure some weak signals. So if we look at this and maybe this is a strong signal and uh, but then there's a weak signal right next to it, but the noise is going to cover that up and we're not going to be able to see it. So, um, all right. So, um, what are we doing on time? Um, all right, cascaded noise figure analysis. So, uh, I talked about the signal noise ratio of the input to the signal noise ratio of the output, and that's the noise figure or noise factor of a single stage, right? But now what happens if we have, you know, a, a 
filter, a amplifier, a mixer. Uh, maybe we've got a couple of or three amplifiers in a row to build up the gain to a decent amount, right? So um, <clears throat> here's here's the concept. Once you have noise added to your design desired signal, it's hard to get rid of, right? So because uh, when we're amplifying the signal, we're also amplifying the noise. Uh, there's all sorts of fancy filtering techniques out there. They get very expensive and uh, they only have, uh, you know, the, some of the fancier ones only have uh, a very specific applicability. But uh, basically, recall that match filter we talked about, right? It matches the spectral tape of the signal in order to remove as much noise as possible without removing the signal. Once you've done a match filter, that's about it. You can't really get much better than that again, in a generic sense, right? So uh, uh, we've applied that. Any remaining noise will just get amplified along with the signal. So uh, our signal noise ratio is just going to get worse as we go through this, right? So uh, every stage adds some noise, but its impact depends on how strong the signal is. Just like I talked about Brian's question. Uh, okay, I got two names down. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, you know, transmitter is working with strong signals, so we don't have to worry about that as much, right? So once we've amplified the signal, then those low level of noises, uh, aren't going to be that significant. Uh, when the signal's low, as in right by the antenna, the noise in the component is going to be significant with respect to the signal. Right? When the signal is high, as in deeper in the receiver chain, after it has been amplified, the noise is small with respect to the signal. So it's not as big a deal. Therefore, noise amplification is more critical in the early stages, and that's where we spend our effort and our money. So uh, if we go through this, I'm not going to uh, derive this equation for the sake of time. Uh, it's fairly straightforward to do, but uh, basically, you're going to uh, work in uh, the linear domain. So if you're given a, a noise figure in dB, then you got to convert that to linear units. And uh, But the um, uh, noise factor is uh, the sum of your initial noise figure, noise factor, your initial stage. And then uh, for the second stage, we look at its noise factor. We subtract one, and then we divide by the gain of the first stage, okay? And then we repeat that. For the third stage, we take that noise factor, we subtract one, and we divide by the gain of the first stage and the second stage, the products of those. So basically all of the previous, previous gains, right? So you could write a, a, a you know, product of, uh, um uh thing out front so um and and so on and so on right after you've done a few of these you'll find that these numbers get vastly small because you're dividing by lots and lots of gain okay so uh so that's the key uh these denominators get large uh so you have uh, less to worry about so uh, we want G1 to be reasonably large, then uh, F1 dominates the overall noise performance of the system. Therefore, the first low noise amplifier is critical in setting the noise performance of the overall system. If we design it for very low noise and also reasonable gain, uh, so that number is low and that number is high, then that's going to set the noise performance and the rest of the stages won't degrade it that much. Okay. Now, ultimately, it's this sum that we worry about when we get to our threshold detector, right? When we're looking at what's the uh, uh, energy per bit by uh, uh, noise or SNR at the receiver, when we're talking about that and all that uh, work we did before in this course, that's at the end, right? At that threshold stage. And so it's really including all of these. So it is necessary to uh, do a good job if we're gonna try to 
extract out the best of uh, this communication system. So a real quick example, uh, an RF filter might have uh, insertion loss of 1 dB. We convert that to a, um, uh, a, a loss term in uh, linear magnitude, but uh, its noise factor is going to be kind of reciprocal of that. Uh, so uh, then we'll uh, look at the uh, low noise amplifier. I'll have gain at 10, 10 dB. Well, that's just 10 anyway, uh, right? Uh, take 10 divided by 10, that's 1. 10 to the uh, first power is 10, right? So that's the easy one to remember. Uh, uh, it has a noise figure of 1.5 dB. That's you know reasonably good, uh, and that's uh, linear units 1.41. Now we'll have a second stage, uh, and here we'll have a gain of 15 and a noise figure of four. That's still not too bad, right? So if you if you don't pay any attention at all to your noise figure, you might get a 7 dB or, or 10 dB noise figure. Uh, probably not going to get much worse than that, right? But uh, but for 40 dB, still reasonably good, just not stellar, right? So uh, so then you just plug and chug. Here we take that first noise factor, then we take the um, uh, the uh, second one minus one divided by the loss of the first stage, and so on. And so uh, I uh, did this here, where we take that filter and LNA and uh, combine those to see 1.78. And then this one uh, is 0.19. So we see that, you know, by the time we're getting to that third stage, uh, which in the simple case is the second stage amplifier. It's, uh, even though it has a much worse uh, noise figure, it's really not impacting the result very much. So we end up with a uh, 1.97. I hope that math's right. But uh, so yes, uh, Kevin. Kevin, why did you put a spring kettle? If you're point seven nine of the denominator, and you spend dB in the denominator also. So you use a linear term and the dB term. Oh, maybe I made a mistake. Uh, so 10 dB is 10. 10 dB is 10. Over here, is this where you're talking? Uh, or are you I talking the difference between these two? Uh, okay. So the 10 dB is the same as as 10. Uh, okay. Yeah, that that 3 dB are the easy ones to remember. Uh, Mohammed. Mohammed. Yeah, um, I'm just curious because now, uh, so when when we drive the amplifier to saturation, right? Uh, yeah. Do you also amplify the noise at that time? Because we're not amplifying the signal level anymore. Yeah, so um, uh, okay, a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, it's really only the oscillator that we're driving to saturation. Uh, and normally, in those other amplifiers, we're trying to stay in a linear mode, okay? But uh, when you are in saturation, you're, uh, it gets, it's very complex because it's now a very nonlinear system. Superposition does not apply in nonlinear systems, right? So, but generally, your, your, um, your low level signals might get a little bit of gain even if your high level components of your signal are not. That's that's super hand wavy, okay? Because uh, you really need a much more sophisticated analysis of that. But the point is, is that all those things in the top, uh, those are uh, those are linear. Even in the that mixer, it's a nonlinear device, but the, the nonlinear part is a switch, you know, coming in from the local oscillator. And it's, transfer function from here to there, even though it's doing a frequency translation, it's still preserving the amplitude uh, of the, the signal as you go through. How did yes. you go from one dB? Brian. Yeah. How did you go from one dB to point seven nine? So that's um uh divide by 10 and then 10 to the uh yeah uh 10 to the X, oh, right? Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, here, this uh, that's a, a loss term versus a gain term. Um, yes, well, log mix. Yeah, may, maybe I should be using 1.26 there. Uh, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't check the math that well. So, uh, so this is uh, this is just kind of an example. 
to illustrate it. And uh, so your your uh, uh, the the key concept here that I want you to understand is that you know our communication systems are driven by that signal noise ratio, right? If you uh, looked at that uh, lab we did, the first part where we're looking at uh, the um, bit error rate for each um, uh, each uh, signal noise ratio, then uh, you'll see that the, the bit error rate gets uh, better and better or lower and lower, right? We're getting fewer errors per per second or whatever, uh, as our signal noise ratio goes up, right? And those curves generally start up here, kind of you know, high bit error rate with low signal noise ratio, and then they dive off, right? And we 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 tend to plot those on a long, long basis uh top thing where where the log is represented in dBs at the bottom. Okay. I probably didn't highlight that in the lab, but um if you know you look at some of the charts that I displayed uh, earlier in the course, uh, you'll you'll see those diving off. But that's that signal noise ratio, or if we relate that to the energy in the bit, the EBNO, the energy per per bit by the noise, we just call it EBNO, and um, uh, that's what is ultimately driving the performance of our system, right? So all this analysis is trying to get us uh, to that point. Um, okay. So uh, intermodulation distortion um, is kind of the, the other side of it, right? So the noise is when we're trying to amplify really small signals and uh, the noise creeps in and it causes us problems, right? When we're amplifying very strong signals, then that's when we can drive our amplifiers into compression or ultimately into saturation. And that causes us some problems also. So amplifiers are only linear up to a point. Amplifying signals beyond that point is nonlinear. In other words, uh, superposition is no longer holding. And um, you know uh, our definition of linearity is you should be able to take Two signals have some gains associated with that signal, and you can just add them together, right? Um, but when you have a nonlinear system, it's not working that way. Uh, you actually get some mixing of signals. Instead of just getting the sum of those signals, you get some mixing of them. And the way kind of very simplistically look at it is you can take a nonlinear gain block and it can be modeled as a power series polynomial, right? Uh, if you've studied uh, nonlinear amplifiers, uh, you may have heard a term of Volterra series. Uh, that includes all sorts of many, many terms. Uh, it gets very complex, but we always tend to like simplify it down. And in, in a more simplified case, we can look at this as a power series. So instead of our input being a linear, a uh, copy of the, uh, instead of our output being a linear copy of our input, right here where B would be the gain and A might be some offset, um, then we also have like a squared term and a Q term, a, quad, a, 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 a quartic term and, and so on, right? So now uh, I go through this in the microwaves graduate course I, I taught a few years back, but uh, the idea here is that if we have two signals here, cosine omega one at some amplitude A and cosine omega two at some amplitude B in uh, a uh, linear system, we would just scale those amplitudes by B and that would be our output, right? But in a nonlinear system, we have this X squared term there. And now we're we're going to take x, this thing, and we're going to square that, okay? So we're going to have a cosine square, a cosine uh, omega 1, a cosine square, and omega 2. But we're going to have a cosine omega 1 times the cosine omega 2 terms in there also, right? Uh, when we square this x here. And if you do enough uh, trig identity manipulations, 
uh, the outputs are going to uh, take the form of uh, cosine omega one plus omega two. Is a P in there too? But a uh, cosine omega one minus omega two, cosine of two omega one, cosine of two omega two, and 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 so on, right? Uh, depending upon how many terms you you carry out here. So this is actually how our mixer works, right? So our mixer as a nonlinear device, it's got a large x squared uh, coefficient c, and so it generates this cosine omega one minus omega two uh, and omega one plus omega two. And so we can peel off the signal for our intermediate uh, frequency. And uh, so um, that means that uh, many of, uh, so, so we're generating more signals than we put in, right? Now, many of these signals are easily filtered out, but some lie in or near the signal passband. Okay, and I'm trying to figure out how much time I have left on this Zoom. I'm wondering why it hasn't uh, timed out yet. Um, so, um, but uh, so, by like those two omegas, those are twice the frequency, and those are really easy to fil filter out. But some lie in or near the signal passband. Uh, we can take advantage of this nonlinearity when we design mixer jet frequencies. But if a strong signal is present at the input of our LNA, it can drive it into saturation or, or uh, nonlinearity, uh, compression, whatever you want to call it, uh, producing these spurious frequencies. So these digital signals interfere with our desired signal. So we want to minimize that. So uh, just a real quick look at it. And uh, here, this would be our linear response. We put in a certain input power, and that gets linearly amplified to our output, right? So we've got a straight line transfer function from input to output. But, uh, you know, if we drive it hard enough with enough input power, then it's going to start to compress and then saturate. We uh, tend to talk about a 1dB compression point where the actual uh, gain is 1 dB less than this kind of extrapolated ideal linear gain, okay? And so uh, that could be called an intercept uh, or uh, IP uh, 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 1 dB compression point reference to its uh, input power versus output power there. Okay, so uh, so here's, here's a, a diagram of what we're uh, dealing with here. So here's our original fundamental frequencies that we stuck in here, but we're getting all these other mixing products. So we get uh, white of frequencies, we get the sum of those frequencies, okay? And then we get these uh, third order products. So these would be your first order, these would be your second order. These are actually technically a second order also. But then uh, like this signal, uh, this signal will mix with this signal and produce this signal also. That's a third order product, okay? So like this, this signal mixed with this signal produces uh, these, up here, and then this signal mixed with that one produces that frequency. This signal mixed with that one produces that frequency signal. There's actually some others that tend to lie on top of top of these, right? But these are the ones we're worried about because they're very close in, right? These are our ideal frequencies. That's all we want to worry about. We want to amplify those, but suddenly these guys appear. And those are distortion products, so we want to minimize those. Um, this is a little bit more advanced uh, drawing now, so we still have this is uh, amplifying our uh, fundamental signals. Okay, the omega one and omega two are being amplified here, but as we start to have some nonlinearities, we find that those third order products are being amplified, generated and amplified, okay? So if we refer this down to the input, 
um, we have an input intercept point uh, 3 dB uh, or, or 3, third, third order, not dB, sorry, third order. And that's where uh, if you extrapolate these linear terms, they show up, they, they would cross up here. We didn't have this compression, right? So just the figure of merit. But um, so this intercept point is up there. And uh, so fit, uh, this, this point is our figure of merit. And we can re reference that on the input or on the output power levels. So uh, I'm going to I'm still curious as to why this hasn't timed out. Every other time it's I'm at 45 minutes in, so it should have uh, timed out. Oh well, I don't think anyone else is uh, is joined, so hopefully this is still going to court. All right, so um, all right, so when we cascade these, um, then it's it's going to look similar to the noise figure cascading, right? Um, this is again nonlinear analysis gets very complex. We make a lot of simplifications for it to be very mild uh, nonlinearities, uh, but uh, there's there's a lot of stuff going on, right? That's why we always like to work with linear uh, things or pure switches, right? One or the other. It's either a pure switch and we can just work in digital logic or it's it's ideally uh, linear and we can assume a superposition. Uh, it's in between that things get really nasty. But uh, with some uh, simplification, basically they're, the signals are separated far enough in frequency that uh, their phases don't uh, match up for very long, right? That their phases are <laughs> rotating at, at uh, different rates, the phasers associated with that signal. Um, and um, so then you can come up with this uh, equation here. So uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to hold you, like, you know, test you on that uh, particular uh, equation there or anything. Um, because again, it's that first stage that tends to to uh, to dominate it. Uh, oscillators are often synthesized from lower frequencies and multiplied up by some factor n. Uh, another useful application of nonlinearities. Uh, if you start with a hundred megahertz signal and you want to get to three hundred megahertz, well, you can run it through a, a diode in a very nonlinear mode. And uh, it will output uh, three times that uh, frequency, and you filter for that, right? So uh, you can also put these in phase like loops. Uh, again, that's more of a circuits and systems uh, type of uh, uh, lecture. But uh, here's the point they can also have spurs and a frequency spectrum. And uh, these get translated into the IF signal band in the mixing process. So that brings us to this idea of the spur-free dynamic range. Okay, so um, it's the difference in amplitude between the desired signal and our highest spur. That spur may come from that local oscillator that has spurs in it that gets coupled to the output of that mixer, or it might come from intermodulation distortion when we have uh, some strong signals at our input that are driving our amplifier into saturation. Um, and so the uh, we generally want to push those spurs down. And those are bad, spurs are bad. Uh, so we, we want to get them as low as possible. But eventually we're going to hit this noise floor that is kind of a consequence of that noise, uh, cascade of noise analysis that we're dealing with, right? So uh, there's really, little need to over optimize that spurious response or intermodulation distortion um, uh, of our system below that noise floor, right? Because that's going to set the, the limit of uh, uh, our dynamic range anyway. So uh, high linearity uh, implies, like if you're trying to build a power amplifier, 
you're going to go with a large device area transistor. It's going to be kind of big, not, not the kind that you squeeze onto uh, Intel or AMD or NVIDIA micro uh, controller chip, microprocessor processor chip. No, these are going to be big, right? And therefore expensive because you're not going to get as many on that chunk of silicon, uh, wafer of silicon. So uh, high linearity implies large device area, high supply voltages, um, you know, we're, uh, if you're building a, a power amplifier, you're probably supplying it with like 28 volts uh, on up uh, type of thing instead of, you know, three volts or whatever, right? So um, use of negative feedback, perhaps uh, lots of other, lots of other tricks. It's non-trivial to simultaneously optimize for low noise factor and low IMD. And that's why uh, your uh, low noise amplifiers uh, are going to be expensive. So uh, here's the idea is that your noise floor is, you know, down here at some level. And uh, uh, we don't, we don't really care when these third order products are below that noise floor. Okay, so that's, that's what's defining our spur free dynamic range. We want that to be as large as possible. Okay, um, so design implications, the uh, RF filter is uh, key to reducing interferers that might cause IMD, but they must be very low loss or it'll negatively impact the system noise figure. The uh, uh, LNA is much more critical and therefore expensive than subsequent gain stages ultimately the SNR EVNO that a receiver sees is that threshold device, but this is where it's uh, dominated. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, signal strength is determined by transmit power, uh, your transmit and receiver antenna gains, your path length, how far you're transmitting, uh, cable losses, polarization losses when your antennas. Uh, you might have studied this in, I think it's 311. Uh, electromagnetic uh, fields, uh, or at least you would in a graduate level class. So it's it's kind of a, uh, you might have uh, done it in uh, uh, traveling ways when you looked at that, um, but it is a bit more advanced there. Um, phase noise has different slopes to it, right? So I, I showed you that uh, peak and then it, it kind of broadened out here. Uh, actually, if you look at those different offsets, it's uh, the phase noise performance is kind of steep here and then it flattens out and then ultimately it's a floor. So it gets kind of complex to, to analyze, uh, but uh, um, you know, we want to minimize the phase noise. So, um, so that's that and how we done on time. I've got 15 minutes to go over the homework. So uh, let me stop that. Wonder if I just started the wrong Zoom meeting. Uh...